Man, I just want to challenge all of us in this room. Uh, it's really easy uh, when, when we know a story, uh, when, we, when we're familiar with the gospel, uh, to just go, man, I'm just going to I'm just going to accept it, and I'm going to come to church and hear the word and hear the story. We do this on Christmas as well, but I want to challenge you. Uh, this statistic came out from Barna this year, uh, and, and, uh, 2022. Um, it says that 50% read the Bible less than twice a year, including never. In between these two extremes, in between this, we find that those who read the Bible more than twice a year, but not on a weekly basis... And then those who do read on a weekly basis is 16%. Now, for most Christians, the, the statistic is that 67% of those who claim to be Christians, this is the percentage they live in. But we say we know God. Guys, you're not here to hear from a man or a woman. You're here to encounter a living God. And I hope that the Lord uses me through the power of the Holy Spirit to speak something to you that might lead you back to Jesus, not an experience. And so my challenge to you is as you sit around with your family this week, read the story. Don't let some pastor just unpack the story for you, but actually get into the scripture because I may have a revelation that you may not get as you're reading it. That you may sit down and go, man, the Lord is speaking to me as he's, he's on the road and he's walking up and he's wa walking down the Mount of Olives and he's walking up to Golgotha. And there's something there for you, but you actually have to get into his word. And so I just want to challenge you all with that, uh, that you would be led back to Jesus and his scriptures, not just another sermon. All right. So Palm Sunday, we're, in, we're beginning the story of the final week of Jesus's life. And uh, what's kind of crazy about that is this starts in Luke uh, 19 and John, it actually starts in John 12 and then goes on for almost 10 more chapters. So there's a lot about the gospels that is just about the last week of Jesus's life where he's fulfilling all of his ministry. And so to give you a little context of, you know, whether it's you understand the story from John's perspective or Matthew's or Luke's will be in Luke's and you know the story of the multitudes gathering and raising palm branches and shouting Hosanna, blessed be the name of the, who comes in the king. Whatever it is, we're going to get just a little bit of context from actually Matthew uh, because there's something important that happens that Jesus uh, finally allows something to happen that he hasn't allowed in his ministry at all and it, it affects the disciples and ultimately, we're going to see here that Jesus is orchestrating his triumphal entry and orchestrating the road to Golgotha and ultimately his death and resurrection. And so let's read Matthew 20, verses 29. And as they went out of Jericho, a great crowd followed him. And behold, there was two blind men sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd rebuked them telling them to be silent, but they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And stopping, Jesus called them and said, what do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, let our eyes be open. And Jesus in pity touched their eyes and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. So this is an important part of the story because right after Matthew 20, Matthew, in, uh, tw uh, later on in 20, he's going to get into his account of the triumphal entry. And why is this important? This statement right here, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. Okay, so this statement, Jesus' whole ministry has told them, don't call me that because that will start the uprising. Okay, so son of David is the messianic title that says, I am the Messiah. Because I, I can claim to be the son of God, but I, I can, when I start to claim to the Jews that I am the son of man, the son of David, thank you so much. When I start to claim that I am the son of David, the Jews are gonna revolt. Because I've already committed some heresy, but this is really it. Okay, and so he's claiming, and the, think about this, guys. We read the gospel in a lens where we're like, the disciples know everything. Well, actually, they don't. The, the disciples in this moment are like, whoa, Jesus let that happen? Whoa, they're freaking out. 
because they haven't even been to the, the Last Supper yet. Jesus hasn't even freaked them out with the, the passage that they're going to drink his blood and break his body. So they're not in full view, guys. We are, thankfully, but they are not in full view. Dear Lord, help me. Help me. Um, they are not in full. I was not used to that round table. I asked for a drink. I got a table and a drink. Thank you, Lord. Um, but so they're not in full view of this. And so they're in this moment going, is, is it time? Is this, is this it? Because in private, the disciples have been told that he is the son of David. But, but he has said, don't tell anyone. Even when he performed miracles in the gospels, he said, a time will come for that, but keep it to yourself. He's kept his ministry quiet. And this is the moment where he says, go ahead, call me that because it's coming. And so the disciples were like, all right, it's time to ride up. It's time to get a horse. Our warrior is here because they also had the Jewish context of what a Messiah is. Even though they're in the face of Jesus himself and has seen his character, they still have a view of the Messiah. And we do this too. We do this too, guys. We, we read the Bible and we know the character of God. And yet our old mindset comes into play. This is why Jesus sat at a table with his disciples and he said, what is that wine doing? It's, it's bubbling. What would happen if that wine goes into that new wineskin while it's still bubbling? Well, the wineskin would explode. And he explains, I can't put that new wine into old wineskins. It will bust. And so the Lord has been preparing everyone to break their old mindsets and their religious mindsets that say, religion is good. That's good. Okay, great. But, but you need to know me as the Messiah. And if we don't work this out, your wineskin will explode. Your heart is going to explode because you will not understand. And so in this moment, they are battling that. They're battling the dichotomy of that they know who the Messiah should be, but the Messiah is still in front of them. And he's a totally different king than what they know. And so Jesus starts to orchestrate his entry. And so I'm going to go back to Luke 19. When he drew near, this is 29, to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olive, he sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village in front of you where you are entering. When you are on, where, where on entering, you will find a colt tied on which, which no one has yet, ever yet sat. Lord, help me read. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he told them. As they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. So Jesus is orchestrating and he sends them to get a donkey. Now, first and foremost, guys, we just witnessed theft. Like the disciples are stealing and Jesus told them to do it. That's kind of actually the context, and we read over it, and we're like, that's totally cool. Well, modern-day context, Jesus is in Pueblo traveling to Denver, and he says, hey, guys, I want you to go to the Colorado Mills Mall, and, uh, and there is a black Tesla, and it is waiting for me. And I want you to go, and I want you to break into it and hotwire it. And when the owner comes running out at you saying, that's my car, I want you to look at them and say, the Lord has need of it. <laughs> and they will be okay with it. That's the context, guys. Like, we're missing the story. We're missing the excitement when we just read over this stuff. And so, but here's the thing. He's in Bethpage and Bethany. And so just a chapter before this, he's, he's doing this with a purpose, See, he's been in Bethpage and Bethany because Mary, Mary and uh, Martha and Lazarus were there. And literally, a chapter before, the whole town is coming to, to faith in Jesus Christ because he called Lazarus out of a tomb. And so, a whole town is starting to follow their view of the Messiah, but this miracle worker 
And so he sends his disciples into a town where he always already has following so that when he says the Lord has need of it, they will, they will give. And just a little side bit, this is a call to us. The Lord not only has need of a donkey, but he has need of you. Some are to go just as the disciples did, and some are to give just as the, the, the family gave their donkey. And maybe we don't get the response of the family. Maybe they're like, no, 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 but then, okay, okay. But that, that is the willingness and the submission that God expects of us, is that we would go and give and be in obedience to him. And so he continues to orchestrate. He gets this donkey that's never been sat on. And you know it's not been sat on because it's probably kicking and it doesn't want to be ridden. Most donkeys are stubborn. They're smart, but they're stubborn. And that's how you know it hasn't been ridden. And so then they throw cloaks over it and Jesus sits on it. And then he starts his descent down the Mount of Olives and comes in. But just real quick, why is he on a donkey? Zechariah 9.9, he is fulfilling the prophecy of the Messiah's coming. It says, rejoice gratefully, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He's disrupting what they expect of him. Not only just the crowd, but also his disciples. Jesus is making sure, knowing his father's will, he will complete every prophecy that was spoken of him so that there is not one iota of doubt that he is who he says he is. So let's continue in Luke 19, verse 36. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would cry out. So contrary to popular belief, let's look at this scene kind of in our mind's eye. There is not a huge crowd. There is a large crowd, but it is not massive in the sense of 5,000 people at, 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 uh, at when he preaches in the miracle of the fishes and the loaves. But it is still a large crowd. And how do we know this? He says the multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God. Well, there's all, well, you would say, well, I don't know if there's a huge crowd, but there's also the Passover of the, fe the, the feast of the Passover happening in Jerusalem at the temple. So all of these people have uh, come together to celebrate. And honestly, if, if I give my real honest opinion here, they're having a party. They may have had a glass of wine and they're like, I see a party over there. I'm going. But there are people there who are there just to celebrate, and they're just celebrating festivities. So they see palm branches, and they're just waving them. And they're like, Hosanna, Hosanna. And they don't really know exactly what they're doing. But then you have the true disciples who have come from Bethpage and Bethany, seeing Lazarus raised. You have the disciples, the 12, who have followed him. And so you have this scene where there's a decent crowd, but you also have the Pharisees who are ready to kill Jesus. They've been waiting and this son of David matter doesn't help. So everyone is seeing that the king is coming and they're quoting Psalm 118. Psalm 118 is a messianic psalm. David prophesies in song of the coming of the Messiah and he says these words, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And so when we get to this, this is why the Pharisees just in the, the same matter that he allowed the two blind men to say, oh, son of David, the Pharisees are like, you're committing the ultimate her heresy. So tell your disciples to shut their mouths. And he makes a beautiful statement that even if they were silent, these rocks would cry out. Man, if I could hear a rock sing, I hope it's better than me. But this is a beautiful theological statement that if creation 
of a person that my father has created is told to, to be quiet, the rest of creation will shout to the creator. Yeah. It doesn't matter what you want to do to me, Pharisees. I am who I say I am. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you try to shut me up. It doesn't matter. I know I'm going to the cross. The creation will worship me, even for those who will rebuke me. And this is the interesting part, guys. The crowd who comes to rejoice him is also a part of the crowd that starts to curse him and put him on the cross. And we'll get to that a little bit. But we see, again, Jesus orchestrating the road to Calvary. And see, just to talk a little bit about the Jews' expectation of the Messiah, how they're worshiping him in this moment, how they're lifting palm branches. The triumphal entry of any uh, big name within, the, whether it was a Roman, uh, uh, a Roman leader or a, a well-known admiral, they came in on a, a big horse and they were celebrated and they were crowned. And so first of all, he's breaking the standard. He's coming in on a donkey. But secondly, they're worshiping in the mind frame that the Messiah was a warrior. And so, and he was going to be a political figure who brought peace to the government because they were oppressed by Rome. And so, he was supposed to come in on a colt and start wielding a sword and start cutting the heads off the Roman soldiers. I don't know if you've ever seen 300, but he was ready to, this is Sparta. I just... I just but that's, that's how they viewed him. I'm serious. They wanted him to be the king that, that met their expectation, that met the, the, the great warrior. But see, Jesus knew, even though they were oppressed by the Romans, the greatest oppression was not being at peace with him. You want me to say it again? <laughs> Jesus knew that even though they were oppressed by the Romans, the greatest oppression in their life was not being at peace with him. And we'll get to that because even more because we'll see the scene where he weeps. This leads to a very powerful moment. 41 in Luke, verse 41 in Luke 19. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it and sang, would that you even you had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the day will come upon you when your enemies will set you up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. If you're like me, I'm very imaginary when I read this scripture. Jesus is on a donkey. He's still on the donkey. His disciples are worshiping him. And he starts to say something that feels very doom and gloom. It's like, Jesus, Hosanna? Hosanna in the eyes? Okay, weird. What do you mean by that? Well, Jesus is not going to reveal everything because he asked those who have eyes to see and ears to hear, let them hear. Um, and so... Jesus is weeping over the city of Jerusalem for, for a couple reasons. First, he's, he knows that their expectation of him is not, re, is not true. And because of their expectation, they have missed the coming of the king of peace. Because the Jews, in their expectation, desired the Messiah to be the king of their desires and not the king of their heart. And unfortunately, we still struggle with this. Yeah. Yeah. We expect Jesus to fit in our box. Whether we wade through our trauma, our hurt, our good times, our bad times, we become selfish in our view of Jesus. And it's no... no uh, surprise that if a percentage of us uh, don't read our scriptures, we don't really know him. So when we put our mask upon the king of glory, it gets, it gets distorted. 
And so in our expectation, we tell Jesus, you're not meeting my needs. You're not meeting me where I want you to be. Guys, it's, it's election season right now. We expect that Jesus is either Republican or a Democrat. He's not. He's the king of the universe. And we'll talk about it. There is a time coming where he will come again as the political peace and set shalom all over this earth. But it's not here in your political system. Am I telling you it, it doesn't matter to vote or, no, or anything like that? No. No. We have dominion on this earth. We, we are, are, are to steward what he's given us and make good choices. But he also sets and appoints kings and rulers. And it is in his control what happens with this universe, what happens with this earth and this kingdom, because ultimately he will usher the fullness of the kingdom on earth. And so... In our expectation, we will miss the king in our life. They are literally missing the coming of the king, but ultimately we can miss the coming of the king just in small moments of our life. We do this in struggle all the time, guys. We sing how faithful God is when he has put money in our bank account. But when we are struggling to put that 10% in or... Or, or, man, when my car breaks and I don't know if I can afford the tires, I got a broken tire right now. I got to get it fixed. I'm like, man, I'm moving. But will I still sing he's faithful, even though he hasn't showed up at this moment? Beyond finances, guys, relationally. Relationally, we, we get an expectation that that person should, should meet our needs and that God should fix that because he's on my side and, and in this relationship. But... The expectation is actually that Jesus touches your heart and touches both of you and just brings reconciliation. But often we're not in tune and we, we expect the king to, to yield, wield the sword on our behalf and not actually bring reconciliation because that's not our heart. And so the reality is, is we put a view on God of our expectation and he's, he's saying you're missing the coming of the Lord. And so this is an encouragement. This is not a, not a hey, you're missing it. It's like, you suck. No. That's, and just so you know, you suck is Hebrew. And I'll, I'll get into that later. No, I'm just, <laughs> totally joking. Um, but he's, it's just an encouragement to say, be aware. Listen for me. Have eyes to see. Read what I'm about and look for moments with me. Secondly, with the doom and gloom piece, Jesus is prophesying here. This is why they don't necessarily have all the understanding. Um, he's prophesying the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem and ultimately all of Jerusalem. So 38 years after this moment, at 67 AD, the Jews start to revolt against the Romans. And in just three short years, the Romans in 70 AD said, we've had enough. And they start slaughtering the Jewish people and destroying the temple. So historically, this isn't uh, all in the Bible, but we know it historically through uh, what, what I'll talk about Josephus and first century writers, is that we know the Roman soldiers actually went on the Mount of Olives. They cut down uh, olive trees and they hauled them into the temple because the, and set them on fire because the, the, all, the oil from the olive trees w was flammable. And so they set the whole temple on fire and the heat was so intense that the gold actually started to melt off the temple down into the cracks and the street pavement. And we know that uh, historically that Roman soldiers actually took knives after it hardened and started peeling gold out of the cracks. And so Josephus, who is a first century writer, he says, he, as he was an eyewitness, he says in all of this craziness, 1.1 uh, million Jews were killed. 97,000 Jews were enslaved. All because they did not recognize the coming of the Lord. Man. That's a weight. That, that there can be such a a weight of understanding who the king is. And if we miss it, the implication on our lives. 
Now, what I'm not saying is if you miss the Lord in your life, you're going to, you're going to die. That's not what I'm saying. This was the context. This was, this was what Jesus was prophesying. This is the moment. Don't take it as descriptive for your li- prescriptive for your life. This is just a description of what's going on. But there is something there for us that we need to understand that we, we must look to see where the Lord is coming to us in our own lives and that we don't put the expectation of Jesus on, on, of our Jesus on him. Jesus does not always deliver according to our expectation. But that only means he has a far better plan than you could have ever imagined. And so when the moment comes and you have an expectation of victory over something and it doesn't happen the way you want it to, just know he hasn't let you down. He hasn't, he hasn't left you off to the wayside and forgot about you. He hasn't not answered your prayers. He's coming in the way that he wants to. He's coming in the way that gives him glory. Amen. I have a question. What is your expectation of Jesus? Have we worshiped him on the throne of our desires? Or have we even not worshiped him because he didn't meet our expectation. But Jesus, no matter what your expectation, Jesus is worthy of your worship. He is the king. Behold, see, here's the the crazy part. All of these people are together. Some of them are worshiping rightfully, but there are some in this crowd who are lifting palm branches with a false expectation and a a wrongful worship of Jesus. They don't know who he is, but yet they're singing Hosanna in the highest. Blessed be the name who who comes in the name of the, the Lord. Don't let your expectation lead you to lead palm branches falsely in worship of a God who is not actually the God of Jacob. Don't start worshiping something because you want it to look a certain way, but it's not actually the God of Abraham. It's not actually Yahweh, the one who says, I am. The one who says, submit your will to me and give me everything. If you're worshiping a God that tells you only give half of what you need, that's a demon. Sorry. Um, But really, it's idol worship. God is requiring all of you. He is requiring to, for you to see that he is not just uh, the Lord of a moment, but he is the Lord of your life. He is not the Lord when you show up on a Sunday and, and, and then walk out of this room and live your life as though he is just a sidecar Monday through Friday, Saturday. Guys, this is why he's weeping. The Greek, so you, we see it's written two times in the text where Jesus specifically, I'm sure he cried more than two times, but specifically where it's written that Jesus wept. It's earlier when he raises Lazarus from the dead. The Greek understanding of that moment of wept is that he shed a tear. But on this Mount of Olives, the Greek understanding of wept is that he is sobbing. He is emotional. He is broken. He is not the king who is a dictator over your life. He is the king who knows what's good for you. And he is broken in this moment. And he's broken for us now for those who miss the fact that he has good plans for us, that he has plans to prosper us, not just for prosperity's sake, but for the sake of your soul. And we sit there and go, you're not good enough. You can't be the king. I'll be the king and you help me out. He wants to be the the true king of your heart, and he wants you to see who the Father, Son, and Spirit really are. He's pleading on the Mount of Olives in his tears. Know who I am. Guys, how, how can we know him if we don't read? How can we know him if we don't sit down and ask him who he is. Can you imagine that, like, relationally? I was having dinner with a couple good friends last night, my wife, and we're just deep in beautiful conversation. 
And we were talking about Exodus and the exile and all these things. And we were talking about people reading scripture and knowing God. And relationally, it's funny. We expect God to know all of us and to know our deepest desires and our needs and meet us in our struggle. But have you ever been in a relationship? I know I have. I know sometimes I've had to repent of the fact that I've been this person in a relationship where you sit across from someone who bears their heart to you and you're like, cool, awesome, great. And they're like, but I want to know about you too. And I want to know what's going on with you. And they don't ask any questions. It's like, oh, great, cool. That's awesome. It's, it's what we call a one-sided relationship. And... Uh, we expect that a lot of Jesus. Modern day Christianity has led us to complacency um, because you can go to a job and get your you can go to a job and get your bills paid and, and you can you can get food on the table, whether it's ramen or a turkey, whatever is in, within that price range for you. It depends on your lifestyle, it depends on how comfortable your job is. But the plague of Christianity today is that we are complacent with the story of a king who has changed our lives. Yeah. And yet we say, I don't know him. Like, I know him, but really we don't. But then we demand God to meet our needs. And we haven't known him as king. We've only known him as fixer. We love to call Jesus deliverer. We love to call Jesus Jehovah Jireh, the provider. But when it comes to king, we get a little bit of a rub. Because we want to hold the things that we desire and also hold him as Lord. And most of the time, the things we do, do, desire are not of the kingdom of God. And we have to live in the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of the earth. Guys, it's a call for the eternal glory of God. Not just the momentary pleasure or satisfaction in a moment. But we only understand that if we know him. If we know him as king and we know him that, he, that we have eternal reward for the suffering and the trial that we face now. And the Bible is very clear. He is one who is acquainted with our grief. He knows your struggle. Guys, there are some odd 200 people sitting in this room. All of us have a struggle. He is acquainted with every grief in this room. And he's asking, will, I, will you let me be the king over that struggle? Will you lay down your expectation of what you think is victory and let me be the king of your heart? Because sometimes, God, the, guys, the struggle, is not, the struggle is not the problem. Sometimes the struggle is just a bystander of the fact that our souls are depraved. Guys, we can't, we can't live a day without Jesus. We try. But we get angry, we get bitter. We get jealous, we get insecure. Why? Because we're not connected to, to who he is. We're not connected to the fact that he is Christ within us, king of glory upon the throne of our hearts and letting him take control. When you have Jesus, you have the kingdom of heaven, which is peace, joy, love, and righteousness. Not anger, bitterness, Despair. So I ask this question again. What is your expectation of Jesus? And I'll finish with this. There is hope for you. Not only in this moment to turn and see the coming of the king in your life, but also in eternity. If you look at Revelation 7, 9 through 10, it says this. After this, I looked. This is John seeing a vision. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and people and languages, standing before the throne, of, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Don't wait for Revelation 7. 
We can do this now. See, they may have not seen fully who the Messiah was, but we have the full picture. We have the scriptures to read. And we can know him rightfully if we dig, dig into his word and we can lift palm branches in faith and surrender, knowing that we are worshiping the king for who he actually is, not for who we want him to be.